Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Ronnie Manning, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Ubico. We want to thank all of you for joining us on today's panel discussion about defending free speech and securing press freedoms. 2020 has been a year like no other. We are currently facing a global pandemic, political unrest, and drastic changes to our everyday lives. And hacking continues to rise and cyber attacks are being used across the globe each and every day to silence voices that matter. Media, journalists, and free press as a whole are under attack in many ways, especially when looking through the security lens. We're honored today to be joined by Stina Ahrensvard, CEO and co-founder of Ubico, Trevor Tim, Executive Director at Freedom of the Press, Harlow Holmes, Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press, and Jessica Aro, Investigative Journalist from Finland's public service broadcaster, YLE. Today we'll be discussing media trends in the last couple of years, what has been done to defend, to defend free speech in 2020, and what must be done to continue to secure press freedoms as we move into 2021. Before we, we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. We will move back and forth uh, during the panel from supportive slides uh, to live video throughout the discussion. And it should run for about 40 minutes with a short Q&A session to follow. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the session via the Bright Talk platform. And please do let us know who you are directing your questions to. To kick off uh, today's session, we welcome Stina to say a few words about Ubico and Sweden's role in protecting free speech. Thank you, Ronnie. The next slide. So a milestone in security actually happened 250 years ago when the Swedish king established a law making Sweden the world's first country to have freedom of the press written into the constitution. Next. Next slide. Ubico was also founded in Stockholm, in Sweden, with a goal to help the internet safer for all. To make it happen, we invented a little key called the YubiKey, and we worked closely with the internet thought leaders to develop the technology into a global standard. Today, the YubiKey and the technology around it is protecting thousands of organizations and millions of users across the world from, from account takeovers. Next slide. But uh, without free press, there is no security. So to help protect the world at large, Ubico is committed to press freedom. And this map from Reporters Without Borders shows the state of press freedom in the world, ranging from good situation in white to less in yellow and orange, to very serious in red and black. So, thank you. Thank you, Stina, for the introduction, uh, the history and the background uh, you just provided. Now, I'd really like to, to jump in and, and direct the next question to Trevor. So, as mentioned in the introduction, 2020 has been a very difficult year for many. Uh, we're dealing with COVID. It's been an election year in the United States, and there's been an increasing wave of social and racial injustices that we've all seen. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how has this affected the media this year, and do you see this as a trend moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and you know, first, I just want to say thank you so much for, for having us here. Um, it's wonderful to be discussing all these issues with you. And uh, we've been working with, with Ubico for so long. So it's, it's great to see the attention on this issue right now. Um, so at Freedom of the Press Foundation, we actually um, run a project called the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. Um, and the idea behind the, the Press Freedom Tracker is much like the map you just showed from Reporters Without Borders, uh, documenting kind of world press freedom issues. Uh, but with the tracker, we are looking specifically um, at the US and at, at a much more granular level. So can we actually quantify and document the state of press freedom in the United States? And uh, so that includes, you know, counting and documenting how many journalists are arrested each year or how many are physically attacked, how many are, are subpoenaed. Um, or have surveillance orders against them. Uh, there's a there's a whole host, probably about a dozen issues that we um, track on this on this level um, in order to better understand the state of press freedom in the U.S. 
Unfortunately, uh, the, the state of press freedom right now has reached uh, crisis levels. Um, there has been an unprecedented number of press freedom violations in the U.S. Um, in 2020. Um, Would you like it, me to pull up your slides? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Um, and so uh, I just want to give uh, people a little bit of context um, uh, ab about the crisis that we're facing. Um, so like I said, every year that the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker uh, documents and counts the number of press freedom violations. Uh, in 2019, there was around 150 press freedom violations. Um, and now this was actually the largest number that we had ever uh, documented uh, since we started the project um, about three years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, so as you can see, in the land of the First Amendment, there was nine journalists arrested, there was over 20 um, subpoenas or legal orders, um, and uh, dozens of journalists had been physically attacked. Um, but so now let's fast forward to the next slide um, to look at 2020's numbers. And uh, as you can see, they are just staggering. Um, starting with uh, the, the beginning of the George Floyd protests um, at the end of May and the beginning of June, uh, police across the country have um, attacked an journalist at a just truly shocking rate. Um, as you can see, there's been over 110 journalists arrested uh, this year in the United States. Over 300 have been physically attacked. Um, and we've actually tracked, uh, these numbers are are already out of date. Uh, we have seven more journalists arrested than you can see here. Uh, we are well over um, a thousand press freedom violations in the U.S. in 2020, um, and it's it, you know it's it's almost hard to fathom. Uh, the number of journalists arrested um, in the first week of the the George Floyd protests uh, was more than the uh, previous three years combined. Um, and you know, this wasn't just in Minnesota, in Minnesota and Minneapolis where the protests started. Um, uh, obviously, journalists um, around the country started covering these protests, um, going to the the protests with their cameras, with their press passes to document them. Um, and there was over two dozen cities where at least one journalist was arrested. Um, there was seventy cities where there was at least one press freedom violation. Um, and so, if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see the staggering numbers here in a graph. You know. You, uh, uh, the first three years, there was a steady um, uptick in the number of journalists arrested that we were counting, and then it just uh, halfway through the year, um, it just exploded. Uh, you can take down the slides now. Um, and so, uh, you know, a, a lot of these incidents um, it, it, people may have seen because they were uh, on social media. Not only were um, dozens of these incidents caught on camera where journalists were uh, shot at with rubber bullets, uh, pepper sprayed in the face, sometimes in a, in a, a helpless state uh, where they were being held on the ground um, and arrested. Uh, these incidents actually happened, um, a, a lot of them happened on national television. Uh, you may remember on CNN, uh, Omar Imenez and his uh, uh, camera crew uh, were arrested um, standing well away from the protests, uh, doing a report um, uh, for CNN at the time. Um, and so these incidents have happened over and over again. Um, and so, you know, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, we are, our specialty is, is really looking at um, uh, digital rights and digital protections um, that we can uh, give to journalists to, to better protect them online, which uh, my colleague Harlow is gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, but it's just been shocking to see the, the, the physical risks that journalists all across the country have, have had to face this year. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately it is um, just one example of, of many that, that journalists face all over the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think anyone who watched TV over the last year has seen uh, some of these instances and the numbers that you just presented are extremely impactful. Um, make the current state very clear. Uh, I'd, I'd love to transition now to, to Jessica and first off say congratulations on your success and, and recognition for your investigative reporting that you've done. Uh, and then with the high profile nature of your work, um, you know, personally, have you experienced being targeted or have you experienced uh, you know, attempts to be silenced? Uh, and, and how have you dealt with this? And this can be you know, from the perspective of yourself and maybe uh, your colleagues as well. Absolutely, thank you so much uh, for having me here and organizing this super important um, panel about the one of the most hottest and most important topics of our times. 
very disturbing uh, developments we are witnessing. Also, the situation in Europe is really bad. For myself, I am basically living, according to police threat assessment, I, I'm living under the threat of impulsive violence if I'm in the wrong place in the wrong time. So basically, if someone who has read fake news about me and has become emotionally agitated by them will cross my path somewhere in the streets, I might get beaten up or worse. So this is where we're at in Finland, which is Northern Europe, one of the most press-free countries of the whole world, accompanied with uh, places like Norway and Sweden. Uh, so what happened to me, basically in 2014, I started to investigate the then latest method of the Kremlin's information warfare, the so-called social media propaganda trolls, who are trying to impact and influence real people online, also internationally. It was actually already a year before yeah. that, the really brave Russian journalists uncovered this troll factory. So I wanted to know, how does it work? Can it actually impact? real people and I started my investigations using um, help of internet users and started to look uh, what were the trolls up to and could they actually control real people or they, their behavior and what I found out was really disturbing but also my investigation made me a target of still ongoing criminal even aggravated libel and stalking campaign so just to give you some numbers examples, uh, I have been smeared in over 300 fake news stories in only one Finnish language fake news site and they portray me as criminal, as NATO and American Baltic services secret agent and that I'm a drug dealer and a drug user and make this monstrous image of me and for that then real people who read these stories they become agitated because they believe it's true. So they attack me and send me death threats and death wishes and even target my family members. So what I have done is that I have taken these perpetrators to court, some of them with direct links to the Kremlin's disinformation machine and some of them operating as proxy, seemingly local Finnish fake news spreaders. But that has also caused more revenge so it's very mafia type of situation in which I am uh, at the moment engaged in and which takes a lot of my time away from my actual investigations of the trolls and fake news. And that's where we're at that, at the moment. And this is also happening uh, to many of my colleagues, for example, people who investigate not just Russia and the Kremlin, but also who investigate, for example, and even report uh, of topics such as let's say immigrants or asylum seekers so there are very heavy racist attacks against them and always conducted in the information space uh, at fake news sites on social media so maybe we want to just show the the, the, the slide that we have for um you want to talk yes. to this slide uh, jessica it, yes of course so we went with my colleague back in 2014 after those brave Russian journalists had already infiltrated to the factory, we went to the uh, St. Petersburg troll factory where there are people who are paid to produce fake <laughs> online personas and fake profiles and promote Putin's policies and, for example, smearing Russian opposition politicians. So we went there and we wanted to find out everything about it. And also we interviewed people who had worked there uh, previously these uh, brave journalists, for example, and um, we made stories not only in Finnish, but also in English. And these stories really circulated and made an impact and were very read because this was a new phenomenon. And, you know, only later on, we actually learned that the same troll factory had even attacked the US presidential election of 2016 in promoting President Donald Trump to become president. So this is the type of stories that make you a target of crimes. Yeah, um, you know, thank you for coming on here today and, and sharing this background, this information, your story. Um, I can't even imagine how difficult this must be to deal with. Um, but we are certainly glad that you are doing your best to stay safe out there. Um, 
and uh, you know, I'd like to continue on um, and ask maybe, you. Maybe we should just uh, mention the book. Jessica, you have written a book. It's called Putin's, what is it called? Putin's Trolls, yeah. It, it, it's a book uh, that I made um, during 2016 to 2019 when i started to speak up about my own experiences being a troll harassment and crime target for my investigations i started to receive connections from people who also became targets and these are western people these are people who are making a difference in their community who are um, for example telling factual information about the kremlin's policies and who are influential enough to be mapped by the russian eventually security services who are the fake news architects behind all these campaigns and they then become smeared and attacked and even attacked in much more severe ways so this is a collection of um, true stories from the front lines of uh, russian information warfare of these brave courageous individuals who basically sacrificed everything uh, just to continue reporting continue um, addressing Russian aggressive policies. Uh, the book is uh, currently only in, in a few uh, European languages, but it's coming to in English later next year, or what's yes. the plan? Hopefully next year, yes. Uh, we, we are looking for a brave enough publisher in the US or in the UK to uh, publish it. Now it's already published in seven or will be published in seven different uh, languages, also in Swedish, and it has been in Polish and many other languages too. Thank you. So if, if, if we are to continue, Jessica, from your perspective, um, being the European representative on, on this call, what are, what are some gaps that you believe exist in protecting reporters and members of the press um, online? Well, one of the basic things is the um, very basic recognition of journalists as a specially vulnerable group that needs special help and assistance and security uh, from the part of the legislators as well as from the police and prosecutors. So the very basic awareness of even this horrible situation that we are facing and that we need support in that situation. So in many countries, um, the situation is similar to what Trevor described being in the United States and, and even worse because there are police and legislators who are actually the ones attacking journalists. Uh, let's not even talk about Russia in this, in this um, scenario being really one of the worst press-free countries. But in, let's say, Western Europe, uh, we would need much more resources, much more police, much more effort, political will and effort being put into the protection of journalism if these legislators still want journalism to basically exist because it is turning into a um, so dangerous profession that very few are still willing to engage in it and are leaving the business because they just don't, um, they don't want to sacrifice everything for it. Right, right. So, Good segue now, um, for Harlow, you know, talking about how we're keeping uh, members of the press secure uh, yeah. you know, from your perspective at Freedom of the Press. How are you working to, to help secure reporters, journalists uh, and other voices from these security threats and, and online harassment that, that we're seeing? Sure, sure. Um, and actually, you're you're entirely right. It's a great segue from what Jessica was mentioning um, regarding the elevated risk that comes part and parcel um, it, as a you know like a practitioner of of journalism nowadays. Um, I guess I'll first off uh, start by talking about what exactly we do um, in my team at Freedom of the Press Foundation. I am uh, the director of digital security where I manage a small but really awesome uh, team that I'm very proud of uh, where we do uh, digital security trainings and uh, we do consulting with newsrooms large and small as well as um, 
housing a small but I think effective um, digital security auditing practice for newsrooms of a variety of sizes. Um, our clientele includes, uh, you know, large organizations that we train on a variety of topics that they they present us with, um, all the way down to freelancers, uh, documentary filmmakers, and other media makers in doing the same thing. Um, we, as a you know, nonprofit organization, we are really privileged to provide, to a certain extent, sliding scale support, depending on what um, an organization or an individual can afford. Um, which uh, actually, like, uh, not only does that I think serve journalism as a practice very well, um, but it also gives us as a team a very unique vantage point, being able to interact with and sometimes even embed with small investigative units, um, documentary filmmaking teams, large corporate structured organizations gives us a unique vantage point to understand what these threats are um, facing uh, journalists and other media makers at a variety of, of um, positions. And that allows us to be nimble, effective, and knowledgeable um, regarding the myriad myriad challenges that journalists face, such as what Trevor was talking about in his introduction and what Jessica was enumerating um, as she was doing research on her book. Um, and we also do have a privileged position um, to work with other umbrella NGOs. Uh, that includes uh, organizations like uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, the International um, Women's Media Foundation, um, the Craig Newmark um, Foundation, and all sorts of other organizations that provide similar services, but like, you know, with their own particular spin on it. Um, and in these collaborations, we get to, uh, you know, like uh, create programs, uh, produce trainings, uh, produce like broad sweeping uh, programs that uh, we get to deliver to a number of journalists across the globe. Um, so uh, this is something that we're incredibly proud of. Uh, but um, I guess like the lessons that we learned is that there's, you know, ultimately no one size fits all solution to these problems. Um, and uh, we encourage, we're lucky that we get to like uh, continue to listen and to continue to react. Um, another thing that I'd like to spotlight is that uh, we've also started to take that approach and turn it internally. So, uh, as Trevor mentioned before, we have our, you know, like United States Press Freedom Tracker. Um, and that is a collaborative effort with a lot of other organizations that includes a lot of freelancers and other smaller news organizations uh, in order to uh, report on, you know, these um, events against the press. Um, but also from a digital security perspective, it means uh, giving the collaborators the tools that they need in order to um, do that job responsibly and, and uh, securely. So uh, that's another really cool thing that we've been working on as well. Yeah, and I know when we previously spoke in, in, in kind of early stages of this panel, um, one of the, uh, that you mentioned is how freedom of the press is also working with universities and students and professors to uh, also bring awareness to uh, online safety. And I'd love if you could elaborate a bit more on those efforts as well. Certainly, certainly. Uh, we have a really excellent uh, relationship with a number of uh, journalism schools uh, in the United States. And we have a principal researcher, who uh, Martin Shelton, who is tasked with uh, working hand in hand with them in order to create curricula that um, either can be taught, you know, like, um, uh, I guess, like for a semester long course, or what we're learning is more likely um, for uh, there to be like individual modules that can be inserted into um, courses that uh, journalism students already receive. So for instance, if you're talking about source protection or, well, source protection is kind of a, a, a hard thing to fulfill, but source communication, responsible source communication, um, you definitely do want to work uh, principles of digital security into the same lesson set that uh, encompasses, you know, just like uh, how Watergate was broken. Um, and uh, there are approaches like that that we're experimenting with. 
Um, the reason why that we're doing it is kind of twofold, um, especially as it corresponds to journalism school students. Uh, first and foremost, we, you know, like uh, we want journalists, future journalists, um, to be as uh, I guess, successful in the field as they possibly can. We want them that when they graduate, they, you know, like hit the ground running, um, are uh, competitive in the marketplace. Uh, that's how good journalism is made. Um, but uh, not only that, and this is probably more broadly um, uh, addressing like uh, things that happen to university students in general. And this actually goes to like, you know, the, the meat of what we're talking about, which is like things like account takeovers and surveillance. Yeah and online harassment. Um, if you are, as a university student, especially in the digital age, you leave a lot of data. And training students to look at digital security, not only from like, you know, um, um, an occupational perspective, but also as a holistic practice for their own lives about how to protect their data, how to um, make sure that uh, they, at least know where you know, like their old grad school papers are, where they reside, what the retention policies regarding that data um, is, uh, things like that. Actually, um, uh, we feel will make them better poised as like you know digital citizens um, yeah. as they leave college and beyond. Yeah, it's um, you know, beyond that. It's it's kind of, it kind of plays into the social media aspect of it as well oh, yeah. um, and and the need to be able to secure that and as as we we look at social media i want to direct to trevor um you know social media is not going anywhere we're, we're it's it's making it a lot easier for any individual to publish content across all these different platforms uh this has created the spread of misinformation this has been a very hot topic in 2020 and i don't foresee it stopping going into 2021. Uh, so my question to you is how does, does misinformation, how does this play into securing press freedom? And what threats um, you know, does this pose to journalistic integrity? And you know, after your answer, love to hear from others as well. Yeah, so, uh, you know, first I, I would just like to point out that, um, and I think it often gets lost in these discussions, especially in the last couple of years, just because there has been so, so much negative news, um, not just on the internet, but about the internet. Um, uh, the fact that uh, that uh, publishing tools are, are so easy to access for the vast majority of the world's population is, is a, a good and, and great thing uh, in many ways. Um, you know, when we're talking about the, the, um, the protests over racial injustice uh, this year um, and, and in previous years, um, almost all of those protests um, uh, were sparked because somebody had a cell phone and was able to um, video uh, the police uh, killing unarmed men um, and was able to easily post that to social media. Uh, that would not have uh, even been possible, or at least not easily possible, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, let alone um, 30 or 40 years ago when nobody had the internet. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, there, there is for press freedom. There are a lot of advantages. Now, obviously, there's there's also um, disadvantages. There, there uh, can be these coordinated um, uh, harassment attacks, like the ones that uh, Jessica was was talking about er earlier, that are um, that are horrible. Um, and uh, but for me, when we talk about um, misinformation, um, the the way that it affects journalists the most, at least here in the United States, um, is not necessarily uh, just kind of random individuals um, posting misinformation, which is, you know, certainly an issue, uh, but it actually comes from the top, uh, you know, political leaders, um, commentators with millions of followers. Um, so, for example, Donald Trump calling uh, the news media enemies of the people or claiming that everything that is written about him that he doesn't like uh, is fake news. Um, this then trickles down to his tens of millions of supporters, um, which causes a, a huge drop in the trustworthiness um, of the media. And so um, this ends up uh, playing out in, in multiple ways, not, not just that um, people are less likely to trust investigative stories that show wrongdoing about certain politicians, uh, but when journalists go out on the streets, whether they're covering a campaign event or they're covering protests, uh, they are running into people who are actively hostile to what they're trying to do. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, we're when we're tracking um, violence against journalists um, uh, with U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, uh, over 80 percent of the, the violence or the press freedom violations have come from police. But there have been um, dozens of instances where private citizens have have uh, assaulted journalists, um, sometimes in a very serious manner. And oftentimes what we're seeing is when journalists, when this happens to journalists, they are, uh, you know, it is accompanied with um, statements from the assailants, you know, essentially saying that, uh, you know, the news media is corrupt or um, uh, they can't be trusted or, or they shouldn't be um, uh, recording public events. Um, and so, it, you know, it's it's really much more of a, a, a of a systematic issue um, that uh, studies have actually shown in the past few months, uh, even that uh, a lot of the misinformation problems that we have uh, stem from our political leaders, and uh, that's actually um, uh, the best place to start when we're talking about trying to fix these issues. Yeah. Hello, yeah, yeah um, I would actually add um, from my perspective in another department at FPS, um, one of the courses that we've had to add um, to our, you know, like catalog recently um, is something that uh, is called digital security in hostile urban environments. Um, yeah. And this is directly in response to what we had heard from a variety of journalists who had come to us, you know, to, to produce trainings. And um, to Trevor's point, what we teach in that course are, um, you know, uh, the quandaries regarding uh, how to properly capture media, like if you are like at an event, meaning do you live stream to a platform or do you record locally before um, uh, and then like, you know, edit footage or Proper re properly redact before uploading it and resources to help you navigate those decisions either as a freelancer or with editors and newsroom managers. Um, and also we teach people a lot about something that Jessica had talked about, like the retaliation. And we're like from our research that we've done in the field, we've learned that it's like dual edged. It's not only retaliation from um, you know, like uh, other members of the public who are ideologically opposed to a free press for whatever reason, as Trevor was saying, um, but it also could be retaliation from uh, law enforcement. So uh, in the event that um, you uh, uh, publish something uh, and then you get a warrant served on your home, because uh, we're all Home based off of like you know the rest of the footage that's in the camera roll. Um, so these are all sorts of like uh, very nuanced skill-based um, uh, topics that we love to talk uh, through with journalists in our trainings as well. Yeah, Jessica, anything to add or we can move on? Yes, I would like to add um, just to underline um, how this may take a toll um, when press freedom is not protected. Uh, from my and many others' point of view, the worst thing is that with these campaigns and attacks happening in the cyberspace, these perpetrators, they instill a feeling of fear inside journalists trying to do their job. So oftentimes, um, it's also uh, found in the research, journalists want to avoid that uh, negative feeling of fear and anxiety, which might come from and follow from their reports. So it's a fact many journalists, they just decide to leave the profession if they are not supported when they are having that feeling of doubt and fear uh, after doing journalism. So every effort to protect um, journalists and help them go through that feeling of fear and supporting their work and telling them that their work is important um, and sending them feedback would make a big difference in helping all these journalists. You know, definitely, thank, thank you all three of you for, for that great insight. Um, I did want to, to go back to Stina. Um, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, the introduction, you know, Ubico, we've we've supported nonprofits, we've supported uh, press freedom, we've supported global organizations who are are working uh, and kind of follow a similar mission to support uh, free speech and human rights. And and wanted to touch on what Ubico is actively uh, doing now um, and and how others can get involved with this. And I'll I'll share the slide. Um, 
we uh, offer um, a way, I mean, we, when we look at internet security, there are many areas where you need to protect yourself, but one of the most common attack vectors is a, a stolen login credential, someone trying to hack into your account and, and get access to your, you know, to your information. And we have a powerful solution for that. That's YubiKey. And what we have done is that every 20 key that's sold on our uh, web store is now donated to journalists and activists and nonprofits. And here on this slide, you see some of the organizations, but it's also individuals. And um, we offer anyone who who are in this in this area to actually come to us. Um, we have a spe special landing page and people can apply to get uh, protection from us. And then also we encourage you to go to Freedom of the Press and get the full training. <laughs> uh, we also donate our keys directly to fr Freedom of the Press. So if you don't want to come to us, you can go directly to Freedom of the Press and get the, the full kit. You know, we are, we are collaborating on, um, you know, I feel very strongly that if our mission at Ubico is, is security, uh, the number one thing we have to do is also to protect free press. So that's why we're doing it as an extension of our work. Yeah, thank I you. Would, and we've, we've, we've yeah, been, just, oh, go ahead. Thank oh, I would add, um, not only can you come to us for YubiKeys, uh, but you can also come to us for training. Our team is incredibly big YubiKey dorks. Uh, so we've tried them out um, in a variety of ways for two-factor authentication, um, for verification uh, as a GPG smart key solution. And we are really well-versed in doing it all. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, and we'd love to talk about it. Did you have something to add, Trevor? Or? No, I was just gonna okay. say almost exactly the same thing. Carlo did, you know, a, a big part of digital security trainings um, is, uh, you know, we start, we try to start from the ground up and um, uh, starting from the ground up means passwords and it means two-factor authentication. And, um, you know, we've been working with, with Ubico since, um, almost since the, the company started, uh, at least a few years. Uh, it, and it, it's it's uh, kind of one of the key tools in our toolkit to to help protect journalists and and teach them about two factor authentication. Um, and we we thank you for the for the partnership, obviously. And and we encourage anyone watching um, to to go to our website to learn more about our program, uh, how you can get involved there, and also uh, Freedom of the Press uh, as well. We will be sharing uh, links uh, a little later that you'll be able to to click on. They'll be in the follow-up emails as well. So we do have a, a final question, um, kind of abroad, uh, just general, what advice from your perspective, closing advice, uh, do you think can be given to journalists and nonprofits who are concerned about, about security risks, whether it be online or personal? Open to whoever would like to, to start. I mean, when someone asks me, why, how can I protect myself online? I always start with um, two-factor authentication. It's better than just using a password. And of all two-factor authentication, YubiKeys are you know, proven to be very strong. You also, you should use updated computers, updated um, software. Um, hackers always find vulnerabilities in software that is old. So um, ensure to always update um, uh, all software that you're using, uh, all apps you're using, um, avoid public networks, uh, avoid downloading stuff, <laughs> avoid uh, emails and PDFs and pictures that comes on your email from people who you don't trust. Um, some apps actually, unfortunately, that you find on you know on the internet, uh, you know even on app stores, can have vulnerabilities, uh, but. You know, uh, then there are other more high privacy tools uh, that I will let uh, Harlow speak about. I'm sure you know them better than me. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, we're a really, really big fan of uh, teaching people uh, to, let's say, um, 
to be more confident in their communications and in the power that they have in order to make decisions. So uh, in addition, I, I think what Stina said is evergreen, which is like, you know, make sure that you keep your software up to date, make sure that you can trust um, where you are uh, getting, you know, software from, um, and that is 100% evergreen. Be skeptical about, you know, clicking on things blindly. Um, but ultimately, like the tools are always going to change. I've been in this industry for, oh gosh, like without aging myself too much, like uh, a little bit over a decade, and I've seen a lot of tools come and go. But ultimately, the tools that we end up trusting are ones that keep those fundamentals in mind. Um, uh, fine, and and it's up to uh, individuals to learn how to like think critically around what tools they're going to use at the moment, rather than you know just like listening to this echo chamber of security experts, of which there are a billion, um, who tell you to use this or that just because it's cool. Um, yeah, and ultimately, uh, don't be afraid to say that you've made a mistake. Uh, because there are people who can help you. There are channels um, that are open uh, where you can ask for advice. Yeah, and I would just add on to that, that, um, you know, security is hard. Uh, we have uh, multiple devices in our everyday lives. Everybody has different types of devices, different manufacturers with different operating systems, which when we're on those different operating systems, we're using... Uh, potentially dozens of, of different methods uh, of communication. Um, and it's uh, unfortunately not the situation where you can just take um, an hour long uh, webinar and you know everything. And so that's you know why we exist at Freedom of the Press Foundation. We wanna help journalists who may be reporting on a sensitive matter and who aren't really sure how to proceed uh, in the safest way possible. So I would definitely encourage um, any worried about that to reach out to us you can go to our website at freedom.press uh, we have a form that you can reach out to us um, uh, uh, to get a training um, and you know to, to all the listeners out there I would just uh, encourage you uh, if you can uh, to donate to freedom of the press foundation uh, you know this is the end of the year uh, we are a nonprofit we are, are totally sustained uh, by donations um, and that's why we can offer um, all of this help to journalists um, around the world. And so um, if you are able to donate, um, please just go to freedom.press press slash donate. And actually uh, for the pa the next two weeks, um, every donation that's made to our organization will be doubled by a, a few of our, our loyal supporters. So, so now's the time to do it if you can. I completely agree uh, with all of you and I'm a firm believer of the principle of not keeping the, all the eggs in the same basket. Um, for example, um, it's a good idea to have many email addresses, uh, some of them without any connection to your real name, many online personas, um, and also many computers, and even many cellular mobile phones, and always uh, hide your whereabouts on social media, because many social media channels, they actually expose your location without you knowing, and it can be dragged out uh, just investigating the meta information. So that regarding to cyber uh, help, and also I agree, it's really great idea to network with, for example, white hat hackers and the security department of your company uh, to get more in-depth help. And it's not really difficult, and it, it doesn't only protect yourself, but also your sources. And when it comes to source protection, it's best, um, if possible, especially in these COVID-19 times, um, to use face-to-face -face meetings. Still, of course, social distancing, but um, not putting everything on digital form is always a great idea. Great, thank you. So we have, we're, we're getting close to time, but we did have some questions come through. A lot of them uh, have already been answered. Um, and I will put this slide up, and these these links should also be available uh, in the Bright Talk platform right now. So someone asked, where can I go for access to technology and resources? Uh, we recommend you know, going to Freedom of the Press. Um, also, yeah. if, 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 oh, go ahead. 
Sorry, um, I would uh, just recommend that uh, not only at you know freedom.press, but uh, if you go to our training page, we have a really um, uh, excellent blog where whenever uh, members of our team have a thought about security or learn a new trick or whatever, we usually write it up and post it there. And there's a lot of excellent information, including primers about how to use a lot of the tools that we didn't necessarily mention here today, um, but are definitely up there. Great. Thank you for that added uh, context. Um, additionally, a uh, question of, of where to go uh, if I wanted to support the cause and make a donation to Freedom of the Press, which uh, Trevor mentioned uh, earlier. So you can go to freedom.press slash donate uh, or go to this URL there and uh, be able to find that information. Uh, thirdly, uh, more information about the Ubico for Free Speech program. Uh, you can find the URL there. Uh, and we've also provided a link uh, for background on Jessica's uh, writing, um, the the background on her book and any other any other details you'd like to to fill in Jessica on what people can find on your your on your URL. Oh, sorry. So yes, please go to that uh, URL to find more about Jessica's work. Um, the the last question that came in and Stina, we can probably. Uh, make this pretty quick, but someone wanted to know just basically how does a YubiKey work? Um, <laughs> what, what can it be used on? Um, it's a small USB key. Um, do you have anywhere? Can you find well, while, while I'm speaking? Yeah. You can do yeah. it there. <laughs> and you plug it into your computer in the USB port or you tap it against your phone. And um, it, in order for it to work, the service that you want to log into have to support it. And all the leading cloud services and a lot of the social media, uh, all the leading password managers are supporting this. A lot of the big IAM vendors supporting. So it's hundreds of services, but it's not everything. Uh, which you know, We are working in order to make it work everywhere. That's why we develop a global standard. So it's... You know, we it's actually that's where the word YubiKey come from. The ubiquitous. You want to do work everywhere. Um, and it... Every time you use it, it sends encrypted passcodes that only works once. And the reason why it's more secure than an app on your phone is that this is a dedicated device that is only does one thing. It only, um, it only authenticates. It, you can't do anything else with it. Uh, and that's actually a good thing when it comes to security because any multipurpose computer or multipurpose phone or multipurpose chip the, you know, you have a bigger attack vector. But if you move your login credential to a key that's outside the computer, is not connected to the internet, um, and you encrypt it, you have a better chance of being safe. Uh, and then in order to get it, make it really easy to work and really secure, that's why we needed to work with the internet thought leaders. We needed to get it into the browser, into the platforms directly. So you don't need any client software, no any drivers. And we added these cool security features. Like when you touch it, you actually have to be a real user using it. You can't be a Troy or a hacker sitting somewhere else. Um, when you plug it in and, and register this to a, to a site, the site remembers the URL, so you cannot be tricked to go into a fake URL. <laughs> uh, and then it's using state-of-the-art encryption. That's just really, really difficult to hack. Uh, but the, the, I would say the core invention of not only like the YubiKey, but the standards we created is that you can use it on multiple places. Because if it's not easy, and if it's not seamless, and it doesn't work on a lot of places, people will not use it. I mean, we are very... You know, everything that is a barrier will eventually not be used. And that's the problem with security. We have a lot of security tools out there, but when they become complicated, we have a tendency to, you know, say, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and then that, so, I mean, what we're going to do between now and, you know, coming couple of years is continue to work with the thought leaders to make an even better user experience. And, and many of the service providers actually that supports the key you don't have to use it every time. You just, you know, you register to a phone, you register a computer, and then it just works. Uh, you don't have to bring up the computer. You don't have to use enter a password. Uh, and that's sort of the seamless, you know, that's that's why it's becoming secure because then you will just use it and you don't think about it, but you're still protected. Great. Well, thank you. Um, 
We've reached our time. Uh, thank you to each of you for participating today. Um, this has been thank extremely uh, informational. It's been eye-opening. Uh, and I think it's been a, a very, very excellent conversation. Uh, and for everyone who is viewing this, thank you uh, for joining us. Please do get involved if you can. Um, and overall, we wish uh, everyone a very safe 2021. And um, the panel has concluded. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.